you know, the first question for Gil is really to start to review a very, very common medicine type that people use for IBD, particularly ulcerative colitis, and that's mesalamine, sulfasalazine, and the five aminosalicylate medications. So medications like Asacol, Mizavant, Salifolk, Pentassa, and so on. So Gil, can you tell us a little bit about these medicines and, uh, and then move on to how they affect the risk of getting COVID-19 or of having a bad outcome from COVID-19? Yeah, absolutely. And from our poll, I think it was roughly a quarter of our audience has actually been on one of these medications. Um, and I suspect many more have probably been on it at some point in, in their IBD history, because these are very commonly prescribed medications. So, and something that we found a little bit of surprising information from the COVID um, world. And so I, what I wanted to do is just give you a little bit of history of these medications uh, and then talk a bit about their impact in COVID. And so sulfasalazine was one of the original drugs that we have for the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease. It was actually created in the 1950s to, to, to treat rheumatoid arthritis. And we know with a lot of patients with arthritis that they, some of them actually will have colitis as well, including some ulcerative colitis patients will have arthritis as well. And so those patients with arthritis who were given sulfasalazine and also had colitis, they found that their colitis got better. Uh, and that led to some studies looking at it as a treatment for ulcerative colitis. And it became one of the earliest treatments. And really, sulfasalazine and prednisone, which was also discovered in the 1950s, were the predominant medical treatments for ulcerative colitis um, and Crohn's disease heading all the way up into the 1980s. The problem with sulfasalazine is that there's a sulfa component uh, on the molecule, on the, on the drug, and there are some people who have allergies to sulfa, and if you take really high doses of sulfa, um, people were also um, experiencing some dose-related um, side effects. Um, and so in the 1980s, scientists had discovered that the medicinal component of sulfasalazine, the part that actually had that anti-inflammatory effect for ulcerative colitis, was um, a molecule called 5-aminosalicylic acid, or we often call it 5-ASA, which is a little bit easier to pronounce. Um, and by isolating 5-ASA, they, they created a new class of drugs called mesalamine. Now in Canada, the most common brands of mesalamine are Asacol, Pentaza, Mesavent, and Salifolk. And depending on which one of these brands, you'll find them as oral medications, um, as rectal medications, either enemas or suppositories. Um, and essentially, all of these mesalamine drugs have the exact same medicinal component, this 5-ASA um, molecule. The difference between them is how they're delivered into the intestines. Um, and that's why there's, there's uh, different parts, but they essentially they have the same drug and the same potential side effects. Now, mesalamine is most commonly used to treat mild ulcerative colitis, but they've also been commonly used, particularly historically, um, for Crohn's disease. But in more recent years, um, gastroenterologists have realized that mesalamine has been less effective for Crohn's disease. Um, and there, we're seeing that we're doing less and less prescriptions of mesalamine for Crohn's disease. Um, as a re result of that. Um, now, the way that they work is they're essentially mild anti-inflammatory drugs that work at the level of the intestine with relatively minimal absorption. And that means that there isn't a lot of the drug that gets into your blood and into your um, in your, into your other organs. Um, and this means that it has very mild immunosuppressive effect. In fact, we really don't think that systemically outside the bowel that mesalamine or sulfasalazine suppresses your immune system to a significant effect. And that's the reason why many of us will, will quote that we don't believe these drugs increase your risk in developing an, an infection. And so now we're kind of turning to the COVID era when we were start, first try, starting to think about, you know, what are drugs that are safe to use from a COVID perspective Virtually all gastroenterologists would widely believe that mesalamine should really not have any major impact of, of, your, of a risk of developing a complication related to COVID or increasing your risk of infection because it really don't suppress your immune system systemically. Now, we have seen some surprising data, and this is more recent data that's coming out of the secure IBD registry, showing that people who are taking mesalamine compared to those who were not taking mesalamine, had a higher propensity for more severe complications from COVID. Um, and this was actually quite baffling or puzzling because as I was saying, we, these are drugs that don't suppress your immune system. So how potentially could these cause these types of, of more severe complications? Well, one of, this, um, one of the reasons why this is an important finding is just to recognize that the secure IBD registry database has some limitations to it. Um, and this is important, not just for mesalamine, but for all the drugs that we're gonna be talking about later in the, in the program. 
Um, and so one of the things is that it's patient self-reported. So we're more likely to report people who are sicker as compared to those who are, are less sick. Um, additionally, we know that misalamine is used quite commonly in countries where there are poorer countries that don't have as much access to biologics. And it may be that in those countries, their healthcare systems don't have as adequate response to COVID. Uh, and again, may be related to more severe complications. Additionally, we're using misalamine more commonly in older patients than there are in younger patients, partly because we worry a little bit about immune suppressive risks in older patients. And we know that older patients are more likely to have bad outcomes for, for COVID. Um, and additionally, as I was telling you before, we're using mesalamine less and less for Crohn's disease, but we discovered in the secure registry there was a lot of Crohn's disease patients who were getting mesalamine, and maybe this is an indicator of poor quality of care of their IBD. All of these factors we call are what we call confounders or other potential explanations for a relationship that we see in, in a study like, like the secure IBD registry. But having said all of that, we do want to be prepared that there could be the potential that there might be some direct effects. And one potential explanation for this is that we know one of the most common causes of a severe complication of COVID causing you to go into the intensive care unit is if you develop what's called a cytokine storm with your body's immune system is attacking your lungs very aggressively. Um, and we know that a drug like mesalamine would not have any impact on treating the cytokine storm. And what you're going to learn a little bit more from, from my colleagues who talk about some of the other drugs is some of the other drugs that we use are actually being used um, to treat this cytokine storm. And so we may be indirectly seeing that effect as well from these, these results. Um, Again, there's a lot of people right now, basic scientists who are taking this data and actually starting to explore animal model research to try to understand if there's a potential mechanism between mesalamine and COVID. And I think right now, if we think about how gastroenterologists are viewing this data, for the most part, we're still guarded by this information. Right now, if you're currently well and you're on mesalamine and you're not having any issues, we still recommend you maintain that therapy because we think if you stop the medication and flared, you might, you'd be in a worse scenario. But what you might find that's a little bit different from a clinical practice perspective is that if you become sick on mesalamine, we might be a little bit more aggressive in getting you on one of the biologics or some of the other drugs that we're about to talk to um, if mesalamine's not working for you. So with that, I'll call pause, um, and, and I'm keen to get if there's any other input from my colleagues. Yeah, so Remo, Jennifer, do you have any concerns about using 5-ASA medications right now with COVID? Would you stop them if somebody gets COVID? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm i not concerned. Um, I think that, again, there's an there seems to be an association towards worse outcomes in the secure IBD registry. But I think that there's a lot of confounders or th other things that Gil has already pointed out um, that may be responsible for that, that have nothing to do specifically with the medication itself. So I don't, I think, you know, the way I think about all of these drugs is, uh, do I think it increases your risk of getting the virus itself? And the answer is no. Um, so you should continue it. Do I think if you were, if you were to contract the virus, do I think it increases your risk of developing the disease? Probably not. And does it increase the risk um, of developing complications of the disease? I think we need to sort of keep our eye on it. But but right now, I wouldn't recommend either stopping or a dose um, or a dose decrease. I think Gil's comment on um, making sure that if you are on this drug and for whatever reasons you're starting to have symptoms, that we should transition you probably to a therapy that may get your disease under control a little bit more quickly. Yes, I, I would completely agree with that. And, and mechanistically, we just think about the, the biologic plausibility as to why someone on this type of medication would have worse COVID-related outcomes. It, it doesn't really have a lot of uh, plausibility. And so for all of those reasons that have just been stated in addition to that, I would have no issues with, with treating patients with uh, this class of medications. 